Okay, so our last, lucky last speaker for the day, um, Patrick Newman from Newman Space Systems, um, actually had a bit of press recently for your uh, plasma thruster technology, uh, and you're here to tell us a little bit more about it today. Yep, terrific. How appropriate. Plas plasma thruster, maybe what we're going to need to get to these asteroids as our last driving force. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, talk over the conference about the, rec the excellent cost savings that arise from in situ resource utilization and the requirement to minimize risk and proceed in baby steps uh, from members of the mining industry. Do I have the system for you? I'll be talking about systems architecture enabled by the thruster that I developed as part of my PhD thesis. Now in my talk, I'll first be covering the motivation for my project and the motivation for these systems architectures, describing how these thrusters work before going on to experimental results from tests of fuels. I'll then describe some system concepts, the infrastructure they enable, and markets that they provide before concluding and closing the questions. So firstly, as we all know, getting stuff into space is expensive. Without nuclear systems, scramjets, space elevator, or some manner of magic solution, this is likely to remain the case for some years to come. In situ resource utilization could solve this problem by allowing us to obtain resources and build things and make stuff in space. You'll still require thrusters to move around in space to get to these resources, to get the processed material, or even just the raw material, take it back to the processing unit. You're still gonna have to move around. This is where my system comes in. Pulsed arc thrusters utilize solid conductive propellant. This makes them easy to refuel. If your propellant is a rod of carbon, magnesium, titanium, you screw in the new rod. You don't have to drill a hole into a tank of hydrazine and try and pump it up and try and mold it shut without blowing yourself up. You don't have to stuff around with pressurized gaseous xenon, trying to match up your connectors between two disparate tanks, get the, get the uh, gas flowing across or pumped across then turning off the valves, making sure there's no leakage. There's no risk of fuel explosions. If you're in a vacuum, there's nothing for them to explode with. Magnesium, it burns rather hot. In oxygen, also in nitrogen. Titanium, burns like the Dickens in nitrogen. There's not a lot of that in space. The high specific impulse that my system enables, and I'll describe these in coming slides, enables a large range of missions. You also have high thrust during the pulse, and if you increase the pulse rate and the number of thrusters you have, you can get more thrust. This is a scalable system. However, this system is still experimental, and we are transitioning to an engineering prototype, and I hope to talk about more of that in the months and years to come. The system works kind of like an electric arc welder. We have a cylindrical anode surrounding a concentric cylindrical cathode. In the very center, we have a trigger pin. The trigger is what we use to start the arc at a given uh, point and time on the surface of the cathode. You can do triggering around the edge of the cathode, but this is less efficient. There is a water jacketed cathode mount in our laboratory system. This will probably still be needed to be used in any production system due to the large amounts of waste heat the large currents through the cathode mount do generate. Whether or not you use water for this or some manner of other coolant, this is an engineering problem. The copper pipes through which the coolant circulates also carries the electrical energy to the cathode mount and thus the cathode for the arc to fire. So, as it operates, firstly we can charge the cathode negative with respect to the anode. The anode in our, in our lab system is connected to the laboratory common ground. In any spaceflight uh, application where you have your ground, this is another engineering challenge, I would suggest the outside of the spacecraft to allow for space charge mitigation. So we charge, you, charge up the cathode. But I've used charging voltages of between 100 and 300 volts. This tends, this tends to work really well. But it's not enough voltage to get the arc discharging by itself. You need to trigger it in some way. We choose to use an electric flashover from the trigger pin to the surface of the cathode. This creates the conditions necessary for the plasma discharge to begin right at the cathode. 
so uh, right at the trigger pin location on the cathode surface. The arc is created from very small spots on the cathode surface, and these spots repel each other as, they, as time moves on, as they're taking energy away from the capacitor bank used to drive the arc. Inside these cathode spots, through processes we don't fully understand, cathode material from the surface of the cathode is eroded, evaporated, ionized, accelerated, and ejected from the system at high velocity. Various people have used this in industry and other academic projects for materials synthesis, surface chemistry modifications, and thin film deposition projects. When I was first doing work on this, I measured titanium ions moving at over 20 kilometers per second and figured you can make a rocket out of this. Experiments to date for my PhD, I have measured the thrust and mass flow rates for 11 different elements. These elements were taken uh, if, as 99.9% pure, so 3.9, fine for all the metallurgists out there, samples from commercial sources. I met, performed measurements at the same conditions, measuring both the thrust and the mass flow rate. I measured the thrust across a range of parameters, also the mass flow rate across a range of parameters to determine what sort of parameters are better for different materials. Perhaps one works well with low current and low, low pulse rate, uh, low pulse duration, one might work well at high current and high pulse duration. I wanted to test this. From the thrust and mass flow rate, I could derive various important efficiency metrics. For the propulsion engineers out there, you might be pricking your ears up, I derived the specific impulse thrust to power ratio and jet power efficiency of all these systems. The specific impulse is effectively the miles per gallon. It's the mass efficiency of the engine. Thrust to power ratio is like it says on the tin, how much power you get versus how much energy you're putting in, sorry, how much thrust you get versus how much energy you put into the system. And the jet power efficiency is a measure of the ratio between the electrical power you're putting into the system and how much kinetic energy you get out in the exhaust. I've also tested an electromagnetic nozzle. You can't make a rocket nozzle out of steel or ceramic in this case because the ions, while the ions move at high velocity, they're highly directed, they're very cold actually. We consider some measurements consider them to be just above room temperature. Thus, when they hit a surface, they plate on it, they deposit. So if I had a steel rocket nozzle, my uh, plasma would just plasma ions would hit it and stop. I wouldn't have the wonderful effects of thermodynamics you see in a De Laval nozzle. Thus, I needed to make one out of magnetic field. I've tested that for magnesium, titanium, and molybdenum. With a magnetic nozzle, I get some really cool results. In these two plots, we can see some magnesium, uh, there you are, magnesium data at the top, titanium data at the bottom. These are for non-eroded surfaces, so they're just being, uh, just being broken in, they've been cleaned of all oxide deposits. This is a fairly flat metallic surface. The left vertical scale is jet power efficiency. You'll notice this exceeds unity. Don't worry, I'm not breaking the laws of physics. I'm not actually taking more energy than was available inside my capacitor bank and putting that into the, uh, the exhaust. This is just energy dumped into the plasma versus kinetic energy of the exhaust. There are other systems that have greater than unity efficiencies for this, such as resistor jets. Uh, the right axis is fuel specific impulse. Um, to give you an idea of comparisons, uh, for magnesium data at the top, chemical thrusters are about there. The whole effect thrust is said to be about 2,000, gridded iron thrusters 4,000, maybe 6,000, and NASA's best well characterized system being high pep is at about 9,500. So this is magnesium as a high efficiency fuel. This is titanium as a lower efficiency but high thrust fuel. Titanium is also better characterized in pulse cathodic arc experiments. I tested titanium under as many conditions as possible to allow people skilled in the art of pulse cathodic arcs to have a better look at it and figure what was going on. So, as you can see, by adding the nozzle going from, with, from coilless, no magnetic nozzle data, it's shown in red here, up to the data with the magnetic nozzle, I showed significant improvement. This outperforms NASA HIPEP. NASA HIPEPs, again, 9600 plus or minus 200 for its maximal specific impulse, producing approximately two thirds of a Newton of thrust requiring 40 kilowatts to do so. Uh, magnesium, however, is over 14,000 plus or minus 2,000 seconds. <coughs> 
rather happy with that. However, thrust budget. You need to have a certain amount of momentum change to get places. We call this delta V to allow us to compare between mission parameters. We determine the total delta V budget of a, si of a system by measuring, by, by knowing the exhaust velocity, which can be determined by knowing this fuel specific impulse, and by having a look at the mass fraction. So you have the initial mass versus the final mass. Assuming a magnesium fuel and assuming a, an exhaust velocity of 80 kilometers per second, uh, a fuel specific impulse of 14,500 implies an exhaust velocity of 140 odd kilometers per second. So as you can see, I'm being rather conservative here. Let us assume a low thrust trajectory, so we can't use kick stages and exploit the overth effect, and thus get a little bit of a benefit out of the magic of celestial mechanics, and uh, have a cheaper trans, uh, delta V budget requirement. And let's also assume half the ship mass of our ship is fuel. We get a delta V budget of 55 and a half kilometers per second. Sounds like a nice number. Low Earth orbit to near Earth, astro near Earth asteroids, generally six to 12 kilometers per second, some of them down, a lot, down as low as two to four under the right conditions. Low Earth orbit to Mars orbit is 15 kilometers per second. Low Earth orbit to main belt asteroids uh, tends to be 16 to 20. There's a large number of potential missions available. If you just want to go there and prospect, you can go there and come back. Refuel your spaceship, it's no longer single use. So, concept one, prospecting mothership. CubeSats are useful objects for a whole bunch of things. They're great for remote sensing because you can pack a magnetometer, a gravitometer, some spectrographs, you can pack all kinds of cool instruments on board your small mass budget and space budget. You can use these for mapping. You can put effectively a GPS system on board your mothership. It'll just measure time of flight of radio signals, basically what GPS does. So you can determine where your CubeSats are and thus uh, integrate that with the measurements from the sen sensors on board the CubeSats to map the asteroid. Once you've made up, a, made up a map with the various data points from your surveys, effectively you've surveyed it. You will have an idea of where mass comms are, where magnetic anomalies are, where any voids might be, where uh, if you're looking spectroscopically, either actively or passively, you'll be, ha you'll be able to look at where minerals of interest might be concentrated. Also where boulders of interest might be concentrated for boulder capture missions. However, there are drawbacks with CubeSats, lovely machines that they are. They have a very small propulsion mass budget and a small communications power budget, i.e. if you just chuck a bucket of, com of CubeSats out the door of the ISS, they're not going to be able to get very far from the ISS, and, when they, and should they be able to get it very far from the ISS, they might not have the power to talk back to Earth. That's where the CubeSat mothership comes in. The pulsed arc is not as energy efficient as a whole effect thruster. Whole effect thrusters tend to give you maybe 40, 50, 60 micronewtons per watt of input power. Our best numbers were for 10 at 27 micronewtons per watt uh, with under warm conditions at the best combination of pulse duration and uh, input current. Molybdenum tended, tended to give us about 20 micronewtons per watt. So they're not as energy efficient. This means we're going to require more solar panel to run them. Thankfully, the guys at RMIT are doing excellent work with thin film solar. They're expecting maybe 800 watts per kilogram of solar, and that's for the complete panel, not just the cells. So you're going to need a lot of power to run the pulsed arc thrusters. When you're not running them, you might as well use that power for something else. You could use that to run your communications system. So your CubeSats will talk back to the mothership, and the mothership will talk back to Earth using its large power budget and its heavy uh, communications uplink. That oh, is all done up in a little box at the top for communications and data handling, communications, sorry, command and data handling, communications and navigation. Uh, this is where Jason excels, so I'm not even going to bother opening that little <laughs> white box. Next one, sample return. You can capture boulders from asteroidal surfaces and to bring them home. Again, you can return them for processing. Again, in this case, we have our extra solar panel for communications. We have a tether system rather than a CubeSat bay. Because you're bringing extra mass home, you're going to want to have some extra fuel on board. Or if you're being really fancy and you've grabbed yourself a lump of something carbonaceous, 
you might be able to scoop off some of the kerogenic carbon off the surface and process that on board. We tested carbon. Graphitic carbon wound up being about as efficient as titanium. So a spe specific impulse of about 4,000 seconds. That's when it's worn. It's a pretty good fuel. It'll do you the same as a, an ion drive or a hole effect thruster. And if you don't have to carry the fuel up there, that's be it's even better. Uh, the in situ resource utilization missions for Mars to produce uh, methane and oxygen fuel, that's great. You can take off from the surface. When you're in space, you either burn more methane and oxygen from Martian surface materials, get home, that's great. If you've gone with a xenon thruster, you're going to need either to bring more xenon with you to come home or bring along a large distillation apparatus to try and capture the trace xenon in the Martian atmosphere. I don't know off the top of my head what the trace percentage of xenon in the Martian atmosphere is. I imagine there will be some because it's a planetary atmosphere and let's face it, it's a heavy gas. It's got a rather uh, large gap between its thermal velocity and its escape velocity. So, with the sample return, you can return it for processing as well. Probably too small for onboard refining, maybe you have a large harvester ship instead. This is again a concept model in, uh, rather than anything with nuts and bolts behind it. Uh, also, you probably want to have several of these, maybe two, three, four, flying as an array. Again, requiring extra command and data handling. If I have four different, uh, four different ships, each holding one tether, five minutes, thank you, each holding one tether, I can be able to balance the thrust and l carry my large boulder or, in fact, smallish asteroid back to Earth in a far more stable and approachable fashion. How this process, processing will work, yeah, it's many different methods. There's carbonyl gas extraction as an idea. You pass carbon monoxide over heated metals across uh, to 500 degrees Celsius. Volatile metal carbonyl species are evolved, which can then be separated by distillation for purification, and then you recover the carbon monoxide via electrolysis. You can also source carbon monoxide for chondrites. Sounds like a market. Carbonyl gas extraction reduces iron uh, uh, residues left behind include sulfide ores and platinum group metals. You put that in a bin for further processing, take it back to Earth, because these ores and these metals favor other processes for, for purification. Which leads us to the first bit of infrastructure the system enables, an orbital smelter. There are large parts of smelting that are more art than science. For example, testing alloy melts mid-process to make sure you've got the alloying species evenly distributed throughout your multi-ton melt. You'll need to develop these techniques close to Earth, where you can get help if you go wrong. And you'll build on the experiments done on Skylab, done on Mir, these experiments done with molten materials. So, let's assume you've constructed your smelter in orbit, maybe as a module on the ISS, you can use space junk as your raw material for testing. You can test your carbonyl process on known alloys before testing asteroidal ores. And to get your space junk, you're going to want some manner of semi-autonomous junk hunting system. Goes out, matches orbits with large pieces of junk, catches them with a net, with a, a squid jig, with some manner of bag, however you want to do this. Don't recommend the space harpoon idea because it'll create more minor fragments matches, catches, returns it, and it removes hazards to navigation and also provides raw materials via in-situ resource utilization and allows you to develop the techniques for smelting. Remember how baby steps are important? By capturing space junk, you can refine your techniques for autonomous orbit matching with small bodies in space. Some of them may, might well be tumbling as well. You can also refine your techniques for redirecting these small objects and clean up local space, and then refuel at the smelter. Reprocessed junk can be executed into fuel rods. I tested magnesium, aluminium, titanium. You make satellites and rockets out of these. These are also good fuels, magnesium being my most efficient. These are the aerospace metals. You can reuse them as rods in the arc thruster itself. These are what satellites are made of. Thus, this is what space junk is made out of. Where there's junk, there's thrust. Reprocess re junk can refuel the junk hunters. Also, CubeSat motherships for exploration and survey missions. Also, satellites can be lifted unfueled to the ISS or other relevant place, fueled for orbit raising. Therefore, you're lifting less total mass from the Earth's surface, and you should have cheaper satellite launches. <laughs> 
Also, satellites, vessels, whatever, can be refueled with ease. You just screw in another fuel rod, make sure the trigger is, is connected, make sure it's working all right, and then chuck it out the back. You don't have any tanks that have to be refueled or after being punctured, maybe. You don't have valves that's got to be worked with and might fail out over time. You don't have any pumps that might not work. You don't have any pipes for, the, for everything to navigate. Solid fuels, potentially far more robust, far more easy to refuel in space. And of course, this, whole, this fuel can be sold. I like to sell it at a profit. If we're willing to sell it sufficiently lower than the cost it takes to lift new fuel from orbit, people will buy it, presumably. Either that or they're very silly. <laughs> this strikes me as a potentially good business plan, which gives us another market. Life extension and refueling. Satellite lifetime is limited by fuel. Either refuel with recycled fuel rods, produced at the smelter, installed by a semi-autonomous unit, or use a tug to provide extra delta V for station keeping. Another semi-autonomous unit can bring defunct satellite down to smelter for recycling after you've given it five years, 10 years, 15 years more life. If your communication satellite is given 15 years worth of fuel, you slatch onto the rocket nozzle at the back and push it along for another 15 years, your telecommunications company will be very happy because it's a fairly cheap lifetime extension and it gives them time to save up for their shiny new satellite. Also, after 30 years, their communications infrastructure on the ground is probably obsolete. Again, another market this can enable. You can stage multiple ones of these and eventually take it all back down for recycling, refueling, reprocessing. In conclusion, the Neumann drive, this pulse cathodic arc I've developed, can open up the inner solar system. It enables diverse mission and business plans. It creates demand for off-Earth resources and therefore markets. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Paddy's taking over. We're going to be working for him. Doing my part. Questions? Any questions? If we um, managed to get to an asteroid, Paddy, and found a solid rock or, or a piece of wall that was solid and then maybe they or fractured something off, is that something we could also put in there? Like, can we put a, you know, a solid piece, of, as long as it conducts? As long as it conducts. If you go to your asteroid, it's a, I don't know, a stony iron chondrite mix of, you know, grab bag of everything. You zoom around, you see this chunk of the nickel iron. Magnet. Yeah, you grab, get your magnet out, you grab a chunk of nickel iron the size of your head, you can bore a hole through it uh, with a hole saw, basically. Have your central uh, shaft drilled through it for the, the trigger rod and insulator, have the external diameter fit into whatever size cathode holder you've got, and there's your nickel iron fuel. Don't know how much delta V uh, you'll get from it because I don't know how much ISP would, would come from that particular alloy. I tested pure elements because the alloy space is rather diverse. Apparently it's close to stainless steel. I'd like to test various stainless steels. Why don't you just test various meteorites? There's a law against that in this country, I'm sorry. <laughs> really, really. You, if, you, if you find a find a meteorite, you've got to give it to the museum, which is fantastic for the museums. Shh. Shh. I'm a bit more of a, a technical question. Looking at, at the direction this research is going, which I think is fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Uh, thinking also in terms, uh, I, I kind of take parallels to the path that the ion drive engine took when it first came out. Seeing some similar things, are, are you compared? How many, how many, what thrust are you getting again? Okay, Micronutons? so during the lifetime of the pulse, the pulse might be 200 to 300 microseconds. During the lifetime yeah. of the pulse, uh, actual newtons, yeah. between uh, two newtons for a low thrust pulse up to the highest we've measured is approximately eight newtons. So you're getting a full eight newtons on this thruster? Of average thrust for 300 microseconds. Are you and looking? Stops. I, I'm asking about where, where you want to take the, 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 the direction of your research because you mentioned a lot. Of, we're going to try this material, this material, this material. Yeah. You got plans to look at the design and start doing design optimizations at some point, or yep. do you see any limitations? Or our next stage of prototyping is to work on cathode longevity. For my doctoral work, this, the cathodes I used were one inch diameter, half inch tall cylinders, yeah. and yeah, you know, they'll they'll show that it works, but you don't have much delta V budget in that much material. If you've got a cylinder that's still an inch in diameter and three foot long though, long though, that's a much greater amount of potential delta V because you've got a lot more fuel there. So what we need to test is longevity. How long does it run until failure? How well does it work after it's been running for three months? Um, 
Are there ways of enhancing this? Are there uh, better ways of doing it for geometry, et cetera, et cetera? Is it being fired in a vacuum or in the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it requires a vacuum to work. Cool. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you. It being uh, after five on a Friday, I'd like to invite anyone who's willing to decamp with me to the Royal Hotel corner of Butlin and Abercrombie in Darlington for drinks and further discussion after the conference. Thank you. Good stuff. <laughs>